let's, uh, let's bow our heads and ask for some divine guidance. Father, we come before you on this Sabbath, and uh, we thank you so much that you have commanded us to come apart from our daily routines and activities. Otherwise, we have no idea where we'd be. It certainly, most likely, would not be listening to you and your word. Father, we pray as we honor you uh, by keeping the Sabbath, we look to you for guidance. We look to you for enlightenment. And Father, we claim the promise of Yeshua that he would lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. If there was ever a time in this earth's history that we need all truth, it is certainly here we recognize that. We believe we are at the time just before your return, which really brings us to the sobering fact is the time of trouble is right before us. And as we look around in the world, we can see that. We can see the armies developing on every side, and we pray that you give us wisdom. And as we're going to be looking at Daniel, we pray for skill and understanding. We pray these things in the name of Yeshua, who died for us and is coming to save us. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. So we are on the second half of Daniel's prayer. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many years it is that I've been studying this, but it's long, uh, a long time. Does that mean I know everything? Absolutely not. Time is no barrier or no way of telling that you've got it all figured out. In fact, the more time that goes by, the more we see that we don't understand. So this is where I'm at today, is it's an ever-learning process that we're in. And it will not stop, we will not stop getting revelation until Yeshua returns. And it's interesting that when the Messiah comes, it's, there's probably not going to be a thing called prophecy anymore. Because prophecy is to help us understand what's coming. And we've got all the prophecies of the kingdom. And I don't think God is going to have to warn us of the enemies coming once we're in the kingdom. So we've got a unique uh, look at prophecy, this side of the kingdom, because it's actually a warning. And when people say, well... You know, prophecy is not important. The only thing is I just have to believe in Yeshua. I wonder what Noah would have done without prophecy. Hmm. We need to consider that. What would have, what, where would have Noah ended up? Probably the same place as the Titanic, maybe. But uh, with prophecy, it warns us of what's coming. And uh, prophecy actually solidifies God's word because it shows us what's already happened. So prophecy has two concepts that are really wrapped up to it. One is when we see fulfilled prophecy, Isaiah 46 verse 10, I believe it is, where it says, uh, I am Jehovah, there is no other. And the reason why he can say that is because he's the one that reveals the future. And that's what that's telling us in Isaiah 46, is he declares the end of from the beginning. So all the way through, he's used prophecy. There's no reason why things are going to change now. He's using prophecy as well. And I'm just uh, a firm believer in the concept that the events connected with the close of probation are clearly portrayed in the prophecies. So that means we should have a pretty good view of what's coming. But before we get into that, we're going to look at what has been, because we can see clearly in the prophecies that have been, we can have confidence in what's coming. So we're going to start, uh, Judy, if you want to go to our slide, uh, Daniel 9, 18. This is where we're going to pick it up. We're just going to back up a couple slides just to pick up the context, and as we saw in uh, Daniel 9, that prayer, right at the onset, the first few verses, set the context for Daniel chapter 9. Daniel is immersed in the books of Jeremiah. Why is he immersed in the books of Jeremiah? It's really quite clear. Just as we're immersed 
in the books that contain information for our generation, Daniel was immersed in the books, the book of Jeremiah, all those chapters, and I'm, I'm sure he got into Isaiah and some of those other prophets as well. But primarily he was looking at Jeremiah. Why? Because the end of the 70-year period was about to close and Daniel was completely focused on that. Now, was he only focused on one thing in the prophecies of Jeremiah? Well, that's a good question. Was he only focused on the 70 years? Or was he focused on the promises that were contained in the prophecies that talked about the 70 years? I propose, just as we are engrossed in the prophecies that contain periods of time, of the time of the end, we're also engrossed in the concept of those events that are going to be transpiring during those time, uh, time prophecies. Just as we are looking at what's going to happen during the millennium, we're trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to be doing during the millennium? Well, that's because we're about to enter that time period within a few short years, I suspect, we will enter that time period. What are we going to be doing? We're, we're immersed in trying to figure out what we're going to be doing during that time period. And then after the millennium, we have prophecies that are going to unfold after the millennium. And we want to understand what those are. And those are prophecies that we're going to walk through. So Daniel, I propose that he was doing exactly the same thing that we're doing today. That's what God's people do. They repeat the past. So they... Daniel was really immersed in these prophecies of the restoration of Israel. And so, uh, lo and behold, he's praying. He's doing exactly what Solomon prayed in chapter, I believe it's 6 of 2 Chronicles. Uh, Solomon talked about if you find yourself in captivity because of disobedience, then pray and pray towards this temple in Jerusalem and so on. Daniel was fulfilling not only what Solomon said, but Solomon was actually repeating what was carried forward from Moses when Moses said, if you disobey, you'll go into captivity and so on and serve those nations. And that's exactly what the promises of God. Now, I propose, and we talked a little bit about this because how does this apply to us? In Malachi chapter 4, we are told, remember the law of Moses, my servant, and that it, what he commanded him on Horeb for all of Israel. Now, if we're grafted into the house of Israel, this promise that is portrayed there is going to be fulfilled on us as well. And it talks about obeying the statutes and the judgments and so on. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So the same conditions that apply to ancient Israel apply to, if you will, modern Israel or the I don't even like to say that because people are thinking replacement. The idea is if you're grafted into the house, you are Israel. So the Israel of God today are those that are grafted into his house through what? Through what means? Through Yeshua. And, and we all know that. I'm talking to everyone. I just need to make that clear because now and again we'll get comments that, oh, you're talking replacement theology. No, I'm not. I've got videos on all of that. Uh, there was nothing that was replaced. Israel, uh, the Israel today is the same as the Israel of old. The problem that people have with the concept is they think if you're a bloodline of the house of Israel, then that's Israel. But it's actually not a bloodline. It's a heart line. Uh, Paul tells us that he who is a Jew who is one inwardly. So if our hearts have been renewed like the uh, Ezekiel uh, 36, 26, and 27, if he's given us a new heart, a new heart that seeks after God, and you start on the overcoming process, Israel means you struggle with God and you overcome. This is what, this is who we are as a people. We become part of Israel as the, the son that was born into the household of faith. So there's a lot of confusion of who actual Israel is, and Paul was pretty clear on that. Um, his revelation through, I believe, Yeshua, he made that very, very clear in Romans and other places, Galatians and so on. Uh, Ephesians, actually. Ephesians chapter 2 covers that quite well as well. So this is why I think Paul takes a lot of heat, because he changes some of the 
it seems like he changes some of the context or um, from the Old Testament being a bloodline to be actually grafted in. And that was a new thought uh, to the disciples themselves. They couldn't figure that concept out, but uh, Yeshua spent some good quality time with Paul and he helped them to understand these things. Let's get back to this now. Daniel 9.18. So these verses, these, this prayer of Daniel actually applies to us exactly the same way. Not the time factor, but the concept. Daniel was told by the books, by the prophets, and so on, by Moses, that if you find yourself in captivity and you pray and you seek you seek me and you turn towards this place, then God will hear. And this is exactly what Daniel was doing. So how does that apply to us? That applies to us because we focus, we are not focused on the earthly Jerusalem. We're focused on the heavenly Jerusalem. Another, the book of Hebrews talks about that in Hebrews chapter 12. That's the city we are seeking. Hebrews thir chapter 13 tells us, we're not seeking an earthly Jerusalem. We're seeking a heavenly Jerusalem. So when we turn our face towards the heavenly Jerusalem and the heavenly temple where Yeshua is even now, I believe, ministering on our behalf, when we turn to him and ask for him to work his will out in our lives, this now becomes meaningful to us. Why does it become meaningful to us? Because... I don't care where you are on this planet. You are in the land of your captivity. Your life has brought you to where you are. And some may argue with this, but uh, Christian, I would, I would say that in Portugal, you are in a foreign country and you are in captive to the government uh, of Portugal. Now, you may not go along with all those things that's going on there, but we are still in the land of our captivity. And Daniel had a little bit of freedom when he was captive in Babylon and then later Medo-Persia, but he was still in the land of his captivity just as we are. Uh, Ryan, you're, you're in uh, captivity in Britain right now. We're in captivity in North America and so on. So we're in the land of our captivity. So this prayer for Dan, from Daniel means a lot to us. And it, we would do well to study it. And that's why when I look at Daniel 9, everyone wants to look at the prophecy of Daniel 9 because there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to say confusion, there's a lot of interest in this prophecy. Uh, there may be a little bit of confusion, but there is a lot of interest in this prophecy. Uh, and I like to tell people, well, if, if you haven't figured out the Daniel 9 prayer, then you may not have any business looking at the, uh, at the prophecy that is later on in the chapter. So we're just going to close up on the prayer because most of us are with there. And, and, and Ryan and Sherelle, I'm sure you're very familiar with this chapter uh, as well. Daniel 9, 18, oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of your righteous deed, because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Now this, I find this very amazing. This is near the end of Daniel's captivity and he had gone through many tests during the time that he was captive in Babylon. He rose in position uh, in the Babylonian kingdom, but he didn't do it by compromise. He did it by means of being faithful to his God. And I mean, that just has to be a lesson for us, is that uh, compromising never gets you anything but guilty. So we don't want to do that. So. So Daniel says here that we're in the land of our captivity and we've seen this. He's confessing his sins, the sins of his people and so on. And in Ezekiel, three times it talks about Daniel. It says, and it compares Daniel to Noah and Job. And I find that very interesting. So Daniel was known by Ezekiel as a man that was equivalent or could be in the same category as Job 
and, and Noah. So let's look at those two for, for just a moment. Because these are the kind of people that we're going to have to be uh, if we're going to get through our Babylonian captivity. So Noah, it says that he was found righteous before God. In fact, it looks like Noah might have been the last man standing that was righteous. And that's probably why he uh, was instructed to get on a boat because everyone else is going to be destroyed. Now, there would have been other people, Methuselah for one. Uh, however, M Methuselah d died the year of the flood, and that's, that's got an interesting story behind that as well. But, but there may have been other people, but all we know is that Noah is the only one that came out of that with his three sons and three daughters-in-law and his wife. Uh, they came out of that on the right side of the water, on the top side of the water. And so Daniel is, is known by Ezekiel as someone that was in the same category, if you will, as Noah. Now we get to Job and the same thing. When Job uh, is going through some real severe struggles in, uh, you might say, the land of his captivity, he became the target of the devil. God allowed the devil to test him. I wonder if God's going to allow the devil to test us here at the time just before Yeshua returns. I rather suspect he might. He, he absolutely, in a sense, it would not be right if he doesn't because uh, that's just the way the story goes. I think the story of Job has a lot of lessons for us here at the time of the end. Uh, when the devil is unleashed... He's primarily unleashed on those who are be obedient to God, just the same way as Job. And we see that Job said, he declared, though he slay me, I will serve him. And this has to be ours because Job, it seems, didn't understand where the troubles were actually coming from directly. And when we get down to the end, we may not understand where exactly the troubles are coming. You know, I think the devil gets a lot of credit these days. Everything is the devil's fault. Well, some of the things are our fault as well. But, uh, you know, we blame, we have a tendency to blame everything on the devil. And ultimately, if there's anything bad that happens, it's the devil is responsible. But uh, a lot of times we will, uh, we're our own worst enemies. But the point being here is the devil is going to be focused primarily on those that, did, that obey God's commandments. And this is what we just talked about in Malachi chapter 4. The devil is going to be focused on those, those people. And so this is what Job was. He was in a position where the devil was testing him in all these different ways. God allowed it because he had to. And the meetings, there was two meetings that were revealed that uh, the devil, Satan, uh, shows up to this meeting in the heavenly Jerusalem, I would suspect, with a whole host of sons of God. Interesting. Whole host of sons of God. And he comes as the representative of planet Earth. And, and we know that. It says, that, you know, God says, where have you come from? Well, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. Other, in other words, uh, we're not on the earth. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to say that, obviously. So this is somewhere else. It would be in the, likely the heavenly Jerusalem in some kind of amphitheater, if you will, where we have uh, pictures of Daniel 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. This was quite the meeting. And God asks Satan where he's been, and Satan says, oh yeah, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. I got everything under control. And God says, well, I think you're overlooking someone. And, um, and Satan did not want to talk about Job. He says, oh yeah, he only gets good things because you're taking care of him and you've put a hedge about him. And God says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll take the hedge out, and then you can see what you can do. And this is... This is what we need to understand. The hedge of protection that God puts around his people could possibly be removed in the time of the end because we are going to have to go through the same test as Job. And this is very, very important that we understand this. Otherwise, when it actually happens, we're going to think somehow God has forsaken us 
but it could be more like that God is allowing us to be tested and tried for our purification. I always, I always think of those people that like the, like the rapture. The rapture theory actually takes God's people, so to speak, God takes people out of a pers- time of persecution and saves them from that type of person, persecution, which is calculated by the Almighty who knows everything. That time of persecution is calculated so that we will be made to stand when Yeshua comes back. How does that work? It works when we go through the fire, we are purified and made white, if you will. So when Yeshua returns, we are able to stand Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 6 and 7 talk about that, who is able to stand. And of course, the the number of those comes back, the 144,000. And then it says there's a great multitude. So this great multitude is raised to life at at the first resurrection, at the second coming. So these people are all able to stand because they have made their trust in the Holy One of Israel. So let's, let's move on. So we've, we've read this, and we were comparing this to some verses in Jeremiah to verify, and we went through the whole prayer and saw definitely that Daniel, he must have had the book of Jeremiah pretty much memorized because his whole prayer is lifted right out of Jeremiah. And here's, here's another verse. Yet they did not obey me or, nor incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, And did worse than their fathers, Jeremiah 24, 6 tells us, For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land, that's Israel. I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Now let me ask you a question here. This is is very interesting here. So in some of the promises of Jeremiah, we looked at this. Jeremiah takes us, in some cases, right through to the kingdom, right through to the restored kingdom. Now let me ask you a question. This says that God will put his eyes on them for good. He will bring them back to this land, the land of Israel. I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Has Israel... Now, let's, let's just forget about the last 50-plus years, and let's just ask the question, was Israel ever plucked up from Israel, the land of Israel, after this, after this promise? And, of course, the answer is yes. They were thrown out at, at least uh, at 70 A.D., and they were dispersed all over the world. That's why we have what we have in Judaism today. And they're all going back to the land. They're starting to claim some of these promises. And there are people even teaching that these promises are now being fulfilled. And they overlook for when they were fulfilled. So uh, that's what we, we need to understand about this. Is Jeremiah was not only given the 70 years. He was giving, given promises all the way to the kingdom. And the New Covenant promise in chapter 31 of Jeremiah is is a classic case of that. It says that you will no longer have to teach your neighbor about the Lord because they will all know him. Well, I have to ask the question. My neighbors don't know him, so we haven't come to that place yet. So Jeremiah saw right to the end. So Daniel, and we need to understand this because this is the way Daniel would have been reading this. Daniel was reading in the prophecies, not only the 70 years, but also the restoration of the land and to the people of Israel and to make the land of Israel the dominant empire in the world. And that's the way the prophecy is written. And and so we need to understand that because that's how we read them. So our job here is how do we put things in their proper place? And that's what Daniel was struggling with here. How's this all going to unfold? Okay, we're going back after the 70 years, and then there's, I see these prophecies about the Messiah in the book of Jeremiah. I see these, uh, these restoration promises about the, Jer- about the books of Jeremiah. So he sees it all the way through to the kingdom, and he's struggling, how long is this all going to take? That's what we struggle with today. That's how I know Daniel was a man 
made of flesh and blood, just like us. The things that bothered him are probably the same things that bother us. We are looking at time. How long are things going to go on? Daniel was the same way. He's looking at how long will it take for these prophecies? He had come to the end of the 70 years, and he knew it was go-home time. This is why he finds himself in the prayer. He says, God, you've got to bring this thing to pass for your own namesake. He says, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Why is he saying that? It's time for God to act. The end of the 70 years had come. Do not delay for your own sake. Why is it for God's own sake? If God doesn't fulfill his word when it's supposed to be fulfilled, then how can we trust him? That's just, the, it's just as simple as that. <laughs> Daniel is trying to protect God's reputation here. This is, what is, this is what's actually going on. And we do the same thing. God, you've got to fulfill your word because I'm witnessing to your word and I'm telling people about what's going to happen. And uh, you've got to fulfill your word. And he's up for that challenge. God is not intimidated by us, by what we do. He's going to do what he says, but we can count on what his word says. goes on to say, Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So they're called by his name. And so if his people are called by his name and they're preaching in his name, then everything they, say, everything they say and do gets reflected right onto God's character. So, so he's saying, you know, we're calling on you, I'm calling on you uh, by your name. No secret to who I'm praying to, because we call upon his name. Jeremiah 14, 7, O Jehovah, thou, uh, though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. Now, I've just put uh, Deuteronomy 17. There's some interesting stuff uh, in there. We're not going to look at that, but it's, uh, it's something of note that uh, is kind of interesting. Also, in Colossians, Colossians 16 is a very controverted text. It talks about the feasts, new moons, and Sabbaths, and so on. Uh, it, and it also talks about something that was against us, um, that was contrary to us. This he took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That's what we see. And of course, people come up with, oh, well, that's talking about the feast. Well, actually, it's not talking about the feast. It goes back to here, our iniquities testify against us. Well, what is iniquity? Iniquity is sin, basically. And sin is anything that opposes itself against God. So what it's actually saying here is the law of commandments is against us. Why? Because we have sinned. And if we have sinned, then we die. And that's what Yeshua did. He took that sentence of death that was written in the law, the judgment that was against us, he took that and nailed it to the cross in the person of Yeshua himself, he took that brunt, uh, the penalty of, of sins that was against us, and he took it to the cross and left it there. Now, we can pick up that tab if we choose before he comes back, because all those that have rejected him, just as Malachi talks about, if we reject God's law, then he will strike the earth with a curse, and we know the rest of that story, and that's all going to happen. Because Isaiah chapter 24 tells us that they have changed the everlasting covenant and changed the ordinances or statutes. And, uh, and it talks about what the result is, and that's the curse. It says that he will come and there will be a curse at his second coming. So the curse is still there. But for those that accept Yeshua as taking the curse that they deserved upon him and him dying the death that we deserve, that we could live the life that he deserved, that means that we don't have to die that death. So that curse has been removed from us and hung with Yeshua at, uh, at when he died. But for those that will not accept that plan, they will take that curse 
and put it on themselves, and that will cost them not only their temporal life, the first death, but it will also cost them the second death, uh, of which there is no resurrection. These are, these are all gospel promises for us to understand as we go through these things. So let's read on here um, in Jeremiah 14.9. Why should you be like a man astonished? like a mighty one who cannot save. Yet you, O Jehovah, are in our midst, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. And of course, this isn't Daniel. This is Jeremiah. When he was still in, in Babylon, uh, prior to the city being destroyed and so on, he's begging God not to leave them, but the numbers of those that left him was far greater. It's kind of like the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, story. There was not enough to save the city. Uh, it was going into captivity, and that's that's what was going on. So now let's uh, move up in Daniel. Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before Jehovah, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. So Daniel has fulfilled the conditions, not only in the Torah, but also in Second Chronicles, when Solomon prayed and fire came down on the altar at the dedication. In his prayer, it's a beautiful prayer, uh, one of the conditions that God would deliver his people from bondage was exactly this. Daniel was fulfilling the conditions for their deliverance, and God was going to act. And I believe that God acts on the word of his people. And just so, that's a lesson for us too. Um, why pray if it has no effect? Is prayer just psychology and it changes our minds? No, prayer actually moves more than mountains. It moves angels and it moves the spirit to move and, and the Father and Yeshua as well. So we've got a very powerful thing, and Daniel was using this power right here. What happened? Well, let's see what happened. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. There's a few things I want to look at. You see... Um, a one and a two there, one behind Gabriel and beginning behind two. We want to look at those things. We want to break that down a little bit because that uh, shows some dots that connect that we don't want to miss. So being caused to fly swiftly reached me about the time of the evening offering. So while I was speaking in prayer, so the idea here is that when Daniel started his prayers, we're going to see, then Gabriel was instructed by God himself to go. Wow, that prayer, you can figure out how long it takes. Uh, it wasn't too long. We might, only, we might have more than that prayer, actually, that Daniel was praying. But he wrote down probably the main things he was praying about. However, Gabriel shows up. The important part here that I want to look at is not just that he shows up, but that he shows up on time. This is really important. For those of you that are looking at the festival calendar, the appointed time calendar, the morning and evening sacrificial time, I, I'm, just, um, I'm just really coming to grips with the idea is that the morning and the evening appointed time is the most important of all the appointed times. And somebody might say, well, how can you say that? I mean, the Sabbath was the first one restored, and then now we're starting to restore the, the other ones. Well, I would propose that the morning and evening appointed time is actually the most difficult appointed time to actually keep. And I know that because I've experienced that. It's not bad to keep the Sabbath. That's just one in seven, you know. And then the feasts are just annual. And some might talk about the new moon as well, which is another uh, appointed time. 
But when you get down to a daily appointed time, not once, but twice at specific times during the day, that becomes a little bit tricky. But I, I would suggest that the reason why that's the last one, and don't miss this point, I believe that's the last uh, appointed time to be restored. Do you know what that tells me? That in the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. Don't miss that point. So if this is a divine institution, it's part of the appointed times, and it's the last appointed time that needs to be restored, what does that tell you about the time that we're living in? If it's true that every divine institution is going to be restored in the time of the end, and we're on the last appointed time that everyone can say, yeah, the Sabbath is restored, the new moons are being restored, the, uh, the festivals, the annual festivals, the spring, summer, and fall are being restored, are restored in, in a lot of cases. Uh, there's people either rejecting them or embracing them. So that's the restoration process. That's the way it's always worked uh, during the um, Reformation. Some accept it. Very few accept it, but much more uh, reject it. So if, we've got, if we're on the last appointed time, then that tells me we are living at the time of the end. No question. No question about that anymore. People say, well, it might be another 50 years. It might be another 100 years, you know. Uh, no, no. There is way too much evidence on the side of we are out of time. And with what, what I see what's going on in the world, and, and I'm not just talking about what the devil's doing, but what God is doing right now, in, in, in many cases, what God is doing right now in the world is much more important than what the devil's doing. A lot of times we're focused on what the devil's doing. And so the devil just loves that. He's got all the attention. So we're focused on the conspiracies, all the bad news, all the horror stories that are going on out there. When God is trying to say, hey, that's, that stuff, that's what the devil's doing. This is what I'm doing. I'm working over here. If we're not focused on what God is doing, we're going to lose sight of what he's doing and we're going to be consumed in what Satan is doing. I hope everyone understands that. Those that spend all their time on conspiracy theories and are trying to get every, all the interpretations of the prophecies out of the conspiracy theories, good luck to that. Um, that's, that's not going to work. Do we need to know what the devil is doing? Absolutely. We've got prophecy to tell us what the, the devil is doing. If I'm consumed in conspiracy theories, how do I know which one is correct? Well, I know which one is correct by the ones that line up with biblical prophecy. And that's how I can sift through it. But primarily, what God is doing today He's waking up his sleeping church. So he's going to bring people out of all different churches. And that's the Israel of God. They may not know they're of the Israel of God, but God is drawing them out of what they, what they, uh, where they are right now. And what are they in search of? Well, there's only one thing that they're in search of. And they're in search of truth. That's what they want. And God is leading them, whether it's um, uh, election truth, whether it's COVID truth, whether it's vaccine truth, whatever, whatever truth it is. He's drawing people to a desire for truth. That's all he needs. He just needs people that want truth. Doesn't matter what it is, just truth. And so when they watch the news, they know they're getting garbage and he's drawing them. Well, what is the truth? What is the truth about COVID? What is the truth about the elections? What is the truth? What's going on in France? What, is the, what are the challenges that this world is having? God is waking up his people to ask for truth on all different levels. And eventually, I believe that where they're going get, to get to is what is the truth of the word? What is the truth of the word? And of course, that's where hopefully 
he's going to be able to use us because I'm hoping that we've got some intelligence into what the word says. Daniel, it says, we're going to see here that he's given skill and understanding. And that's what we are praying for. God, give us skill and understanding so that when people want the, the truth that is in the word, we will be able to stand in the gap and deliver. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Okay, so now what we're going to look at here is uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Let's turn to there, shall we? Or I think I might have this actually, yeah. Let's, let's go there right now. Deuteronomy 29, 29. I bring this up because this is really important for us to see this in this context. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to Jehovah our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. I'm going to throw out a concept here. This is so vitally important. And I've got another text here that we're going to pull in uh, to, to really secure this idea. So the secret things belong to God. There's no question about that. He's not letting us in on everything that's going on. It's a good thing he's not. Uh, we might go overload if he does. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that or so that we may do all the words of this law. Let's put those thoughts together. So we have things that God has revealed to us so that we are able to do the words of the law, so that we can be obedient. So God has let us in on some things so that we will be obedient to his law. Well, what is that? Well, we the book of Deuteronomy and 29, 29, where does that come from? 27, 28, the blessings and the cursings. It's very important in these chapters that we obey God's law. And he's given us, don't miss this, he's given us enough information that we can do this. Now, when we look at that, our time context where we're at, we've got the book of Daniel, we've got the book of Revelation, sister books, if you will. We've got prophecies contained in those, in those books that shed light, clear light into our generation and what is before us. He has given us that light so that we can be obedient. You see, the book of um, Daniel and the book of, uh, the book of Revelation are all about obedience. Daniel, we just read that here. He learned that lesson. Those that are living in the time of the end have to learn that lesson. We see that in Malachi. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. And so we see that in the book of Revelation. Here are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in the gates of the city. You see, those that don't do his commandments don't have a right to the tree of life, which means living forever, and they will not enter into the city. Which city? Not an earthly Jerusalem, but a heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem, that the earthly Jerusalem was only a type of the heavenly Jerusalem. That's why, one of the reasons why I say the new earth is going to be much more glorious than this one, because it's going to have the city of the great king, um, in its heavenly form and that's what we're looking forward to so we go here and then this this next text kind of goes right on the heels of this where there is no revelation and you want to look at the the actual hebrew in here where there is no prophetic revelation or prophetic vision the people cast off restraint but happy is he who keeps the law now we're going to be looking at something here in the book of Daniel, and Daniel's going to become uh, acquainted with the understanding of the time frame that uh, Jeremiah spoke about, and this is what we're becoming familiar with, is the time frame that both Daniel and Revelation speak about 
in the time prophecies that they uh, are uh, that they portray as well. So where there is no revelation, the people cast off all restraint. And there you go. Where there is no prophetic vision, the ca people cast off all restraint. What does it mean to cast off all restraint? That to me means that you start doing things that you should not do. That would encompass sin and so on. So the prophetic revelation has been given to restrain us from doing those things that are natural for us to do. And you will remain happy, it goes on to say, but happy is he who keeps the law. Because the law restrains us from doing evil, and God has given us prophetic revelation so that we know what's coming in the future, which will help to restrain us. That's why these prophecies, you know, some people, oh, prophecy is just an interesting thing. You know, the book of Revelation, you'll never understand it and so on. I'll tell you what, we have to understand these things. If we're going to do what God is calling us to do this last generation, then we're going to have to have a full understanding. And the promise that Yeshua said to his followers way back then, he said, I have many more things to tell you, but you can't handle it right now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you and lead you into some truth. Somebody help me out. Does it say some truth or a percentage of the truth? He says all truth. And then he goes on to say, and he will show you things to come. That's prophetic revelation. So the reason why he's, he's given us this the reason why we have to have this all-encompassing, what Yeshua spoke about, is so that we will not cast off restraint of being what comes natural to us, but we will keep his law and we will be happy about it. Now, I know people that, you know, they have a big, long face because they can't do what they want to do on the Sabbath. But you know what? Not doing those things that most people do uh, is actually going to keep us happy. It's kind of a reverse thing that's going on here. So now let's go back to uh, our prophecies, shall we? So we want to look at the first, um, the first little thing, that I, the first dot that we connect. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning. So this is Daniel chapter 9. Daniel had two previous visions. One, uh, Gabriel shows up. So we've had a lot of people um, decide that this vision in Daniel chapter 9, this is one of the connecting dots. Well, this actually is not one of the connecting dots, as we're going to see here. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen at the vision at the beginning. So we're going to look at one thing here. We're going to look at Gabriel, where Gabriel was seen in the prior vision in Daniel chapter 8. And then we're going to look at the vision at the beginning as well, because he says he saw him at the vision at the beginning. So we need to know and understand this so that we can know how to connect or how not to connect these visions. So here we have in Daniel chapter 8 where we see Gabriel. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now, who is this person that is telling Gabriel to make this man under, uh, understand the vision? I would propose this is none other than Yeshua himself that was standing above the waters of the river. And he says, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. This is the same person we see in Daniel chapter 12 that shows up again. And Gabriel, um, there's three people, one on this riverbank, one on the other riverbank, and one that's above the waters of the river. And he swears by him who lives forever and ever. That would have to be Yeshua. And if we carry that forward into Revelation chapter 10, we see exactly the same person in Revelation chapter 10 doing exactly the same thing, swearing by him who lives forever and ever. So we see here Yeshua shows up in chapter 8 of Daniel and he speaks to Gabriel and he says, make this man understand the vision. Now we see in Daniel chapter 9 where the father tells Gabriel 
to go and make Daniel understand the vision. The question is, is it the vision of chapter 8 or is it another vision? And many have concluded, well, it's more information on the same vision. And we, that's exactly what we want to look at here. So make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood when he came. I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. So, you know, we just want to park ourselves here for a moment and just take a look at it. So Daniel is told by none other than Yeshua to make him understand the vision. The first thing Gabriel tells him is not the explanation of the vision, which we have the, the Greece and, and uh, it says the king of Greece and the Medes and the Persians. And then it's broken into four horns and then we see a little horn and so on. That's not the first thing that he says, Gabriel. Tell Daniel to understand the vision. The first thing that Gabriel tells him is when the vision is going to be played out. Don't miss this point. This is extremely important. It's like Yeshua in Matthew 24. They said, well, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Well, he doesn't bust into the explanation of all the events that are going to happen, which he does. But it's not the first thing he says. He says, don't be deceived. So the most important part of what Yeshua says is not all the things in the vision. The most important part, which he comes back to three or four times in, Daniel, in Matthew 24, the most important part of the vision is not to be deceived during the time that the vision or Matthew 24 gets played out, which is a good portion of the book of Revelation and a good portion of the book of Daniel. Not all of it, of course, but the most important thing for us to remember is this vision is at the time of the end. That's what it says. You can grab as many Bibles as you want, and uh, they basically all say the same thing. This, I believe, to be the New King James. I use different translations, New King James. We can't miss this. Make this man understand the vision. Daniel, the very first thing you need to understand, I know you're grappling with it. I know you don't understand what's going on. But this vision is for the time of the end. So get it out of your mind that you're going to be able to figure this out. Just forget it. This is not for you, Daniel. This is for a generation way down yonder. And uh, so then it goes on to, I haven't got this verse in here, but verse 18 says, Daniel, he was confused and, and he lost all of his strength. And then uh, in verse 19, he says, look, Daniel, look, Daniel, I know you don't get this, but this prophecy, this is going to happen in the latter time of the indignation when the wrath of the lamb shows up at planet Earth. For at the appointed time, at the Moed, at the appointed time that God has on his calendar, that the wrath of the Lamb shows up on planet Earth, this is the time frame that we're talking about here. This is what the vision encompasses at this time. It says it not once, but it says it twice. When God says something twice, we need to take note of it. But he says it a third time, actually, in verse 26. Therefore, seal up the vision. If we go back to uh, the back of the book, back at Daniel, it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, God says this again to Daniel. Daniel, seal up the vision and uh, it's not going to be understood. That's exactly what he says there. He's saying it again. So this, it says, seal up the book in Daniel chapter 12. 
And the book of Daniel, the, the understanding, the entirety of the understanding of the book of Daniel is not going to come until the time of the end. Do we have pieces of it? Yes, we have pieces of it. But the full understanding of the book of Daniel is not until the time of the end. And people say, well, what do you mean? All those things have been fulfilled. I, I want to just take the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. Daniel's life in captivity. If you take parallels out of Daniel's life in captivity, it is a prophecy of what our life is going to be when we're captivated by Babylon. The whole thing. And I've gone through this before. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Um, you know, the kings are, kings are trying to give us something that we don't want to eat. Is there a movement afoot that they want to give us things to eat that we're not really like familiar crickets? with like uh maybe crickets and and uh worms and all kinds of stuff yeah they've got it figured out what you're going to be eating uh yeah it just gets crazy when you start looking at this um but daniel was faithful and it says that he gave him understanding in all dreams and visions wow i wonder if god's people are going to get dreams and visions in the time of the end Chapter 2 of chapter uh, 2 of Acts tells us that in the time of the end, God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. They'll prophesy, young men, young maidens, and so on. And uh, what would a vision be without the interpretation? Well, we could all get mixed up pretty good without that. So the prophecy of Daniel being faithful and being able to understand visions uh, is going to be pretty important. And then in chapter 2, there was a statue made. In chapter 3, they had to worship the image of the statue. It wasn't really the king. It was just an image to the king, and so on. Well, wow, that's uh, chapter 13 of Revelation. We can see thrown to the lion's den because we're not allowed to pray and honor God the way we feel we should. That's chapter um, uh, 6, and so on. It's just, it, there's so many parallels, but it wouldn't be until the time of the end that we could actually draw these parallels. Why? Because we're starting to see how they can unfold in today's society. And, and even with these time prophecies, we're starting to see that as well. So Daniel here in chapter 8 is told to seal the vision up. We will not find any of that concept, not even that concept, in Daniel chapter 9. He's nowhere told to seal it up. In fact, he's told to understand it. And, uh, and then he's told him exactly what's going to happen in chapter 9. We're going to look at this shortly. He's told him that uh, what's going to happen. So here we see in Daniel chapter 8, he's given a vision that is for the time of the end. And he's told to seal that up. There's a very interesting concept when it comes to Bible prophecy. One is the concept of symbolic Bible prophecy. And some prophecy is literal. If you compare chapter 9 to chapter 8, you're going to see that chapter 8 is, is symbolic, completely symbolic. It's all given in animals and horns and, and so on. But chapter 9 is totally literal, exactly the way it is. So that, that poses a bit of a problem, a bit of a disconnect between those uh, two as well. So let's move on, shall we? Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, cause, uh, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So we're going to do some some rewinds on these texts because there's more things that we need to look at with these texts. So that word uh, beginning is uh, H8462. What does it mean? From 2490 in the sense of opening a commencement, relatively original, uh, beginning first time. Okay, so what is this saying? So in Daniel, where it says that he saw Gabriel in the vision at the beginning, it's the opening vision or the first vision. So, so by him saying that to connect the dot with Gabriel, then it has to be talking about chapter 8. All Daniel is saying here, all that he's saying 
is this is the same dude that I saw at the vision at the beginning. That would be chapter 7, technically. So he's actually referring to chapter 7 when he says this. He's not referring to chapter 8, although he did see Gabriel, but he didn't say the previous chapter. He just said at the beginning. If he wanted to connect this to chapter 8, he, said, he would have said, he's come to give me understanding of what I didn't get from chapter 8, because I had seen him previous. But he's just saying, this is the same guy that showed up uh, in chapter 7, the four beasts. And it's interesting that the four beasts in chapter 8, obviously, and I hate to use that word, but obviously, chapter 7 and chapter 8 do go together. Now, there's dispute on how they go together, but they both are dealing with symbolic things. Uh, four animals, four horns, little horn, little horn, and uh, time period, time period, both referring to the little horn activity and so on. There's no question Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 go together. No question. The question is, how do we mingle Daniel 8 and, uh, or Daniel 9 with Daniel 8? And that's the challenge that we have. So here we have him referring back to Daniel chapter 7. So let's look at this now, uh, as we've just looked at this verse at the beginning. So Daniel chapter 8, we have a ram, a he-goat, four horns, little horn, 2300, evening, morning. Very important. It's evening, morning. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. Okay, so Daniel himself, now if we can quote him from Daniel 9, he says the vision at the beginning, then in the very beginning of Daniel chapter 8 vision, when he puts a time factor on here, he says, it, the vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. The word first time there is the same word from Daniel chapter 9 when he said, said I had seen him at the, at the beginning. So we know by Daniel chapter 8 that Daniel chapter 8 was not the beginning, but Daniel chapter 7 was the beginning. Now somebody might say, well, who cares about all these details? We need to sort this out. If we want to sort these prophecies out, where they belong and where they don't belong, we need to get into the weightier matters of them so that we can decipher whether people are taking them out of context or in context, especially here at the time of the end. We've got a lot of people that want to take the, the 490 and throw the whole thing down into the future some want to just take the last week and throw it into the future and say it was broken up, disconnected, and so on. Uh, but we, we've got to know why we can't do some of the things that people are so willing to do today. And I propose to you that it's because they're not willing to look at what the prophecy actually says and what it does not say. Just what it does not say sometimes is more important than what it does say. Nowhere in Daniel chapter 9 will you have Daniel saying, this is some kind of continuation of Daniel chapter 8. Now, when we look at the, the data and the specifications in Daniel chapter 9, and we look at chapter 8 and chapter 7, we can see clearly there are different kinds of prophecy. One is symbolic. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8 are both symbolic. Daniel chapter 9 is literal. We can't miss this point. So he goes on in Daniel chapter 8 verse 1 to tell us that he had a prior vision. Daniel chapter 9 says Gabriel showed up in that first vision that I had. Why does Gabriel show up? Because Gabriel is the one that announces, we know this for sure, Gabriel's the one that announced the first coming of the Messiah, which we're going to see in Daniel chapter 9. But he also shows up knocking on both Joseph's door and Mary's door, telling them that they're going to, Mary is going to have a son, and he's going to be sitting on the throne of David forever. 
And this is the one, the same Gabriel, I believe that this is the same Gabriel that announced not only the first coming, but in the second coming prophecies of Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9, or Daniel chapter 8, he's announcing not only the first coming in 9, in chapter 9, but the second coming as well in chapter 7 and 8. And so that we've got some some concepts here that we need to deal with. Daniel 7, in the, it tells us in the first year um, of Belshazzar, I think. So we have four beasts, a little horn, time, times and a half. So we have another time frame. Uh, we can't miss these similarities. Four horns, little horn, time period in chapter 8. We have four beasts, little horn, time period in chapter 7. And uh, it tells us there that this is the opening or the commencement the first time from Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. Okay, so here, here we have, that's the first thing about Gabriel. We've dealt with that. Gabriel is referring to the same one in Daniel, um, Daniel chapter 7. So here we have, we've got, I've got this a little bit smaller. Hopefully you can see this because I want to tag on here some information just so we can see this clearly that Daniel did have uh, some other beings in chapter 7 that showed up because a lot of people don't see that, but it's right here in plain sight. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit. Now this is the interpretation of the vision. I was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. That's verse 15 to 17 here that we're looking at of chapter 7. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of those things. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three guesses um, on who this might be, and the first guess is not going to count. Yeah, there you go. So, would anyone here, sitting here, like to guess on who this guy is, this being that's going to give Daniel the interpretation of this dream? Would that have been one of Daniel's friends? No. Not likely. If we can go by what's gone before us, it would be some kind of angelic being that is familiar with giving interpretation of prophetic things. Is that making any sense to anyone? Is it possible that the same one that showed up in Daniel 8, Gabriel, that gave him the interpretation, is the same one that shows up in Daniel 9 that gave him the interpretation, is the same one that shows up with uh, Mary and Joseph, which really, in reality, gives them the interpretation of the promise, it's going to be you, uh, you're the one that th this promise is going to be fulfilled on. So he gives them the interpretation and the fulfillments of how this is all going to play out. And he says that I saw this guy in the vision at the beginning. Is it possible or is it way too obvious uh, to even say that this is Gabriel right here? It can be no other being than Gabriel. He is the one that is sent from the throne of God to give the interpretations. And it says, one of those who stood by. We had more than one, both in Daniel 8 and Daniel 10 through 12. We had more than one show up there. We saw this. And so this is the same kind of thing. His multiple beings show up to give Daniel the interpretation. But I would say, I would suggest that Gabriel would be the one here that gives him the interpretation. Then he goes on to say to start the interpretation, those great, uh, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. We're not going to go through that. That just shows here. This is symbolic. It's symbolic in Daniel chapter 8 and not symbolic as we're going to see uh, in Daniel chapter 9. Okay, Daniel chapter 9. Let's go back there now. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you skill to understand. This is what our prayer needs to be. God, give us skill to understand because we do not want to go wrong. At the beginning 
of your supplications, the command or the word went out. That's the same word as we're going to see. It's significant. Went out. And I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the, the matter. It says the word matter there, but it should be the same word, word. The word, um, consider the matter, or the debar, H1697, and understand the vision. Okay, so we want to look at this because the word here is debar. Let's go one more text here. Daniel 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the Debar, the word of the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolations of Jerusalem. Here we go back to where we started. Daniel was concerned about the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Just the same way we are. We are not focused so much on Old Testament prophecies that have nothing to do with us. We're focused on Old Testament and New Testament prophecies that have everything to do with us. Daniel was focused on prophecies that he believed had everything to do with him. Of course, he didn't have the book of Revelation. He didn't have any of the New Testament. So he was working with, with half the book. And... I, <laughs> I like to think that we have an, a huge advantage over these Old Testament Bible writers and Old Testament people because we have much more of a complete story than what they were working with. God, in just a few books, you might say, had all the way through to the end of the millennium, but we've got much more information on what's going to transpire during that time. Daniel 9, verse 2, so the word of the Lord spoken of by, uh, through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolations in Jerusalem. So here we have, Daniel is going to give him skill to understand. What's he going to be given skill to understand? The matter, but it's the same word as word. It's the same thing that he's studying. He's studying the word of the Lord. Is it possible that Daniel's actually be giving, giving understanding here in the, in the play out of the understanding? We're going to see this. He's given understanding of the restoration of Israel in the land of Israel. And he's shown that. And that is exactly what the word of the Lord to Jeremiah was all about. He's studying the end of the captivity, the restoration period, and so on. This is what Daniel is studying. I propose, I would suggest quite strongly, that Daniel is not struggling with a vision that he had five years. I mentioned 13 years. I had that. I misspoke there. It's actually about five years later than Daniel chapter 8, the vision he had in Daniel chapter 8. And so this is about five years later when he has this vision. It says right in the context of the chapter that he's wrestling with the word or the matter of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. And so this is what Daniel comes to give him, the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, the vision that Jeremiah had uh, of the restoration of Israel. This is exactly what Daniel is given through Gabriel. And as we go through this, we're going to see this very clearly. There is nothing here about a ram and a he-goat and so on. This is only about the restoration of Israel in the land. It goes on to say, 77s, says 70 weeks, but it should be 77s. This is kind of important because the Pentecost cycle is in sevens, seven weeks or seven sevens. Um, and then on the 50th day was the day of Pentecost and so on. This is kind of how they kept track. So 70 weeks or 70 sevens actually interprets. Now, somebody might say, well, that's the day for a year prophe uh, prophecy. But it really isn't that because the way they kept track, they called a week, if they're talking 
context, if the context demands that we're talking a week of years, then it's a seven-year cycle, and it's the Shemitah or the Sabbath years that it's talking about. So this is actually what this is talking about. That's how in the Book of Jubilees is the same same thing that they refer to weeks can be years and they do it seven because it's the word seven so it's the context that demands whether we're talking about a seven day period or a seven year period or so on and this is this is what we see here daniel would have understood what this meant 70 weeks or 77s is what it actually says there are determined for your people and for your holy city so Daniel now, let's get, the, let's get the time context. He's praying about the restoration of Jerusalem and Israel in the land, the going home from their captivity. And the answer comes back, you need to understand, it's going to be 77s are determined or cut off. Okay, if, I, if I'm looking at, I don't have much room here, but I've got, let's just say that this is my lifespan. Let's say that this is my lifespan. I can take an off-ramp here, just like anyone does in life. They take an off-ramp, and they jump in front of a bus at the end of their life. Okay? So I could say, if you want, uh, it's been determined there, or I've cut off. I've been cut off from something that could have been longer. So what God is saying here is that Israel's lifespan, that's the context, is going to be determined at a certain point. Seventy sevens are determined upon your people. And this is very, very important that we look at this uh, because we're going to see what's going to happen here. Number one, and I've written it like this because it, we don't get the import of it if we don't look at it like this. 77s are determined for your people and for your holy city. The word determined there is like cut off. And I, I think I have, uh, I have the word here uh, in Strong's here, I believe, coming up. So we'll look at that in a moment. For your people and your holy city. Number one thing that they were going to have to do during this time was to finish transgression. So God's going to give us some conditions. It's 77s are determined here, and you're going to have to do these things. To make an end of sins, finish transgression, make an end of sins. This is pretty closely connected, I would think. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Now, how can I make reconciliation for iniquity? Well, if I steal something from someone, I suppose I can make reconciliation for iniquity to bring them back four times or whatever. Um, that would make reconciliation. But ultimate reconciliation for iniquity is my reconciliation with my creator. And that's really the most important part of the reconciliation for iniquity. And I can only do that through provision that God has made through Yeshua to bring in everlasting righteousness. So God says here through Gabriel that 77s are determined for you to bring in everlasting righteousness. How was Israel to bring everlasting righteousness? Well, Israel can't bring everlasting righteousness, but they can do they can bring everlasting righteousness through the Messiah that was supposed to be born to the house of Israel, had they accepted, this is what we don't seem to get, is Israel had free will, the house of Israel had free will to either accept or reject their Messiah. Had they done these things, they could have brought in everlasting righteousness. Now, I don't know how that would look. I haven't been given insight into that. All I know is this is what it says. And I have to accept it for what it says. Seventy-sevens are determined to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy. 
Well, that's a real stumper, isn't it? To seal up vision and prophecy. If Israel would have accepted the Messiah, which I believe would have, got, would have been God's first choice, obviously, um, the reason why a lot of people don't understand this, the reason why he was whipped and beaten to an inch of his life was because the devil didn't want him to go through with what God needed him to go through with if we are going to be saved. That wasn't what God was doing to Yeshua. It was what God was allowing Satan to do to his son to show the ultimate love of God to what extent God would go to save us. Now, if that doesn't quicken your mind to the love of God, that he would allow those things to happen to his son, anybody out there would allow you, uh, you would allow your son or daughter to be tortured like that in your full view. The reason why God did that is because he had to in order to save us. It only took a sacrifice, not a beating or a torture procession on the Son of God. It only took a sacrifice, much like that of Abraham and Isaac, to save us. So to seal up vision and prophecy, had Israel accepted the Messiah, then things would have played out a lot differently. I can't give you the details on that, but it would have been a whole lot different uh, on that. And those prophecies that talked about the second coming and the ram and the he goat and the four horns and the little horn and those time frames may have been sealed up forever. Is, that, is it possible that's why in Daniel chapter 12, God says, seal up the book until the time of the end. Because those prophecies would have never been needed, very likely, they would have never been needed to be unfolded if Israel would have done what God was calling them to do in this prophecy of chapter 9. Let's keep going. The next thing that they had to do, the next condition of this promise, to anoint the most holy. Okay, so we've got finished transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. I would propose that this is what the last generation is going to have to do. We're going to have to finish with transgression. We're going to have to make an end of sins. We're going to have to make reconciliation for iniquity. We're going to have to bring in ex everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy. It will be no more. And to anoint the most holy, to anoint the most holy. What is that talking about? We want to look at that just a little bit in a moment. So, 70 periods. This is from the APB, which is based on the Septuagint. Seventy periods of seven were rendered concise. In other words, this is what it is. Rendered concise. That's that word determined. Upon your people and upon the holy city. To finish off sin, this is how, and I've just laid out a little different, but this is taken right out of the APB. Uh, to wipe out the lawless deeds, to, make, to atone for iniquities, to bring in eternal righteousness, to set a seal upon vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy of holies. This is really interesting here. So, to anoint the holy of holies. Wow. Same thing that we're going to have to do here. This word, holy of holies, um, that we're looking at, or sorry, this is the word decree. We're going to look at that first. Uh, properly to cut off. So that's determined. Properly to cut off, that is to decree or determine. So Israel's lifespan, if this was Israel's lifespan, they were going to have, they were going to be given 490 years to do these things. It was determined, decreed, or cut off. 
cut off from the length that they could have had. Had they kept going, that would have continued, but they were given this time period to do these things. And you might say, well, that's, you know, it's a long period, but not a very long period. Israel had been under God's protection, uh, basically, if, if we say that the founding of Israel was in the time of, of Jacob, because he was later known as Israel, but Israel went down into captivity, into Egypt, the house of Israel, and they were set free. So, so that was, you know, it was about 1,500 years all total that Israel, so at a 1,500-year period, but if we go from the time of Abraham to the time of, uh, of Yeshua, that's pretty close to 2,000 years. So Israel was under the protection, if you will, if you want to call Abraham the father of the Jewish nation, then God had them for about 2,000 years. But we came to the point where after the king's disobedience, captivity, and back and forth, the seesaw thing was going back and forth, God comes to Daniel and he says, you only got 490 years left. After that, it's over. If you guys don't do this, it's over. And that's really what God was telling them here uh, at this time. This word here is used once in the Old Testament. Does that mean anything? Well, it might mean something to somebody, but the, the meaning of the word is to cut off Israel would be cut off, this amount of time was cut uh, out of their lifespan. Now, it says to anoint the most holy. I want to look at this very interesting here. To anoint the holy, which is uh, in the Greek, it's G39, the holy of holies uh, in 3923. Hebrews chapter 9, 23 of course, this is a very interesting book, shows you the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament in the sanctuary. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So it's comparing the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. And then it goes, he goes on to say in chapter 9, verse 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places, same word from the Greek of Daniel chapter 9. Uh, holy places made with hands, which are heaven, uh, copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, if I was to ask anyone, where was the presence of God in the earthly sanctuary? You would say on the whole, in the Holy of Holies, in the innermost shrine of the sanctuary. That would be where the mercy seat is. So if that is a picture of the heavenly, where would you say the Father is sitting on his throne today? I think you would have to say in the Holy of Holies. And this says that he was to anoint the Holy of Holies at the end of the 490. Let me ask you the question now. Where did Yeshua go to um, uh, at the end of his stay here? At the end, as we're going to see, uh, at that time period, in the last week, if you will, of that time period. Of course, he went, according to the writer of Hebrews, which I believe to be Paul, he went to the Holy of Holies and began his work in the sanctuary above the work of the daily, um, of the priest's work on the earthly sanctuary. So the whole focus was then transferred, and that's what the book of Hebrews is trying to demonstrate, the earthly sanctuary was a type, and it's very clear, it's in there, was a type of what the heavenly sanctuary uh, was, and everything on the earthly sanctuary was patterned after the type, including all the animal sacrifices, um, the priests, uh, the garments, everything was a type of the heavenly uh, sanctuary. And that's where it says right at the end, to anoint the most holy. And at the end of the 77th uh, prophecy, Yeshua went into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary and uh, anointed that as well. So we see here a, a perfect fulfillment as we go. It says, uh, I want to look at a couple other things here. In Matthew 18, 21, 22, 
Then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And uh, I will forgive, or I forgive him till seven times. Like that's, that's a lot, you know, if I have somebody that does the same thing to me seven times, how often do I have to forgive him? Well, Yeshua gives us the answer. Verse 22 tells us that Yeshua said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now this I find to be pretty interesting because this is exactly the same time period that is mentioned in Daniel because there was 70 times seven days of atonement from the time that the commandment went forth, which we're going to see, it was 70 times 7 that God forgave Israel for all their shenanigans. And Yeshua said until 70 times 7 because he was personally acquainted with forgiving his brother Israel. You know, we are considered Israel's brothers, Yeshua's brothers. He has forgiven us 70 times 7. And I wonder if this was connecting something to Daniel 9, well, we can see in Daniel 9, this is what it says in the um, Good News Bible, different translation. It says 70 times 70 years is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from sin and evil. So this is the Good News Bible translation. Of course, different translations do it a little differently. Some people don't like these other translations, but sometimes they shed a little more light, make things a little clearer. This is the intent, I believe, of Daniel chapter 9. 70 times 70 years, uh, length of time. So we can have 490 year period out of this. And that would technically be 490 days of atonement when God would forgive Israel for all their past sins of that year. So Yeshua was speaking out of experience when he said that. Now I want to go to Mark 1, 14 and 15. That should be Mark 1, 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Yeshua came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, that word, um, that word time there, 2450, it is an occasion that is a set or proper time. It's not talking about any old time. Yeshua was saying that there is a set time in the word. I believe that's what he was referring to. There is a set time that has been fulfilled. And I am the fulfillment of that. And I am preaching repentance. What is he preaching? Repent and believe the gospel. Friends, brothers, and sisters, if we would go to Daniel chapter 9 and put an end to sin, finish transgression, and all of what Yeshua said, the kingdom would come. That's what he is waiting for us to do that. And of course, he knows the set and proper time that that will happen. But Israel was given a set time that was cut out um, for them to repent and do what they were supposed to do. And Yeshua came telling them that the time is fulfilled. Connect that with the 70 times 7 that he talked about and the time being fulfilled. There can be no other time being fulfilled than the 77 spoken of, of Gabriel of the first coming of Yeshua. Does it say that here? No, it doesn't. But I ask, what other time could it be talking about? It's definitely an appointed time in God's calendar. Paul's letter to the Galatians has something very interesting as well. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is guardians and stewards until the time appointed, there we go again, the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, 
were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under, unto the, or under the law. So here Paul is also doubling down on the idea that at the set time, at the appointed time, the time had come that God would send his time. What time? We can see in other places, uh, Thessalonians for sure, we can see in other places that Paul was very familiar with the book of Daniel. And it's very likely he was talking about the same appointed time that Yeshua was uh, talking about when he came to Israel to call them to fulfill the specifications in their repentance back to God so that uh, they would accept him as the Messiah. And there again, things would have been much different had they accepted the Messiah. So here we have here verses 3 and 4 of Galatians. Even so, when you were children, you were under bondage, but now the fullness of times had come. And it's, uh, this is the word 550, a space of time. So here again, a space of time, uh, which designates a fixed or special occasion from which denotes a particular period or interval by extension an individual opportunity by implication delay, years old, season, space, time, a while. So this here is talking about a specific time period that that's, that's the wording that Paul uses, the same kind of thing that Yeshua used as well. This is a specific calculated time period cannot be referring anything other than Daniel chapter 9 in the 77, 70 week prophecy. Acts chapter 1 verse 6 and 7, therefore when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time, same word, this appointed time, restore the kingdom to Israel? Why were they asking that? I wonder if they were asking that because they knew that the prophecy of the 77s had come, become fulfilled. These are just good questions. Would they have known and understood these things? I believe Yeshua probably would have referred to them. Uh, will you restore the kingdom at this time? Why? Because he was in that last week of the prophecy when the conditions had to be played out in order for them to bring in everlasting righteousness. And that's exactly what they're asking here is the fulfillment of the kingdom in their time. Same, same word there. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons. He's connected both of these concepts together now. Now, I find this very interesting. The set time in the years, the number of years, and he's also connected with the seasons or the appointed times. So what he's brought these two things together so it's not for them to know the length of time that Yeshua would set up his kingdom, but that even the Moed as well. And we see this exactly, this is what Paul says in uh, 1 Thessalonians. So Yeshua says it's not for you to know the exact length of time or the appointed time. Two different words are being used here. And so in Thessalonians, Paul tells us, for this we say by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, same context here, now we're talking about the time of the end, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ rise, will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. But concerning the, here it is in a, again, same thing as Yeshua. He's quoting basically Yeshua. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. I used to think that the reason why they had, he had no need to write to them, because they knew. Well, no, they didn't know. Because Yeshua said, it's not for you to know. 
it would not be in God's best interest to tell them way back then is that he's not going to come for another 2,000 years. How would that have gone? Probably not that well. Yeshua said, it's not for you to know because I can't tell you that it's going to be this long. And it's quite evident that the disciples thought it was going to be very much sooner than what, where we are. They thought it would, could be easily in their day. And that's, that's really easy to demonstrate. But anyways, Paul doubles down on what Yeshua says. And he says, you have no need that I should write to you. Why? Because Yeshua has already said this. It's not for you to know. You just get about your business and do what you're supposed to do and let the time factor take care of itself. I propose that for those living at the time that this will be fulfilled, it will be mandatory for them to know the time and the seasons because that's what's going to shelter us from deception. Are you with me? Do you get that? So it wasn't for them. Yeshua said it's not ever for you to know the times and the season. No man knows the time of the season, not the sun, not the angels, not any man. He didn't say no man will ever know the time of the season. That's what it doesn't say. It's more important what it doesn't say than what it does say. Yeshua made a truth statement there. He said, the sun doesn't know when he's going to set up his kingdom. The angels don't know. There's no man that knows. Only the Father knows. Very interesting. The Father did not reveal it to the Son when he was going to set up this kingdom. Have you ever considered that? There's a reason, there's a specific reason why he did not tell the son. But the point being is it was true back then that no man knew the day and the hour, not the son, not the angels. But he did not say that the son will never know the day and the hour. He does not say that the angels will never know the day and the hour. Neither does he say no man will ever know the day and the hour. Because the way the prophecies are written is once we get the typology of the sanctuary figured out, we can know that he's coming at a certain festival. We can know that. We can't know the, which one. I, I don't know whether it's one year, two years, three years down the road. But once the time prophecies, once the events connected with the close of probation are starting to be seen in the world, I would suggest, I am convinced, that we will know the day and the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. But God has reserved that to a time period that I am not familiar with yet. I do believe I've got the festival figured out. The year, that's another matter, but I don't think we're that far away. Let's go back to, shall we? Now, we are, going to, uh, we are going to stop here at this first because uh, I'm probably wearing out the patience of the saints here, and I don't want to do that. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 22 and 23. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Somebody tell me who this is talking about. Messiah the Prince. And now we're looking back at what Jeremiah was talking about. Until Messiah the Prince. Is this talking about the first coming or is this talking about the second coming? Somebody help me. This is talking about the restoration of Israel in the land after the 70 years. This is what I want to double down on this. Daniel is being shown the restoration of Israel up until the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. That's Yeshua himself. So he's taking right from the restoration all the way down to Messiah, the Prince. That's what the 490 is about. That's the time for it. He's shown the conditions of it. And then he says, this is what's going to happen. Where do we get Messiah the Prince out of Daniel 7 
and Daniel 8. Well, we do get Messiah the Prince, but that's the second coming. This is the first coming of Messiah the Prince. Now, therefore, and understand from the going forth the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Yes. And here again, this is talking about uh, an unfolding of the events of Mark 1, uh, 12 for 15. That's when Yeshua says, the time is fulfilled. What time is fulfilled? This time has been fulfilled. And it's interesting that it's broken up uh, like this. I'm not sure exactly why it's broken up like this, but we're going to look a little more carefully at this next week. And we're going to get glimpses as to possibly why this is broken up the way it is. Uh, Mark 1, that's the fulfillment when Yeshua came saying the time is fulfilled. And that's where in Galatians he talks about uh, in the fullness of time. When time had met its fullness or the culmination of this prophecy from Daniel chapter 20, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. So we're going to leave it at that and then we're going to get into the rest of this uh, next weekend um, and, and unpack the rest of this. And we're going to look at the, the fulfillment of this prophecy and how that um, is connected to the time of the end or maybe how it isn't connected to the time of the end. We're going to look at both of those concepts. So I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, today. And we're doing a bit of a deep dive into these prophecies, which I believe is going to help us a lot in our um, sharing with other people to show where these prophecies actually belong and where they don't belong. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone coming. It's, it's been another good day. Uh, stay, stay in the book. And let's have, some, let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that is sure. And we ask that you continue to work with us, especially here in the time of the end. We claim again the promise of Yeshua that you would lead us and guide us into all truth. Not just some truths, but all truth. This is what we need as we're going into this time period. Father, we pray. Uh, I want to pray for everyone here that's dropped into our meeting today. And be with those that couldn't make it today, Father. We pray that they were blessed where they uh, were today. Continue to guide and lead us, Father. We give you full permission to speak to us through your spirit, Yeshua. Lead us and guide us, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, you guys. And we'll dive into this again next week.